Well, welcome everyone uh, locally to our, I think it's our ninth, like uh, Tecumseh Talks event. Um, this is one that Peter and I got to see um, a preview of the other day. Uh, so we're actually very excited. Uh, Vancho Sarovsky is here uh, to show us a little work uh, that he does in, in team culture, a little bit of different approach. Um, we like it because it's a different approach to culture and really focusing on the uh, the DNA of team chemistry. So Vancho's tested this in, in NCAA environments and OUA environments and uh, currently in the MLS environment. So Vanch, uh take it away. If you have any questions as we go, guys, for the coaches talks, we keep them more informal. So either throw it in the chat or, uh, you know, just kind of ra like raise your hand uh, with the raise your hand tool and, uh, we, you know, we can get the question as we go. So Vanch, take it away. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, thanks for inviting me to do this. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to colleagues and friends and particularly because I know some of the people on here. So we'll keep it very informal and lighthearted. And some of the stories that we'll share will kind of resonate with some people. Um, so um, I think what I wanted to do is just give you a bit of a background into, as to, you know, what the model looks like and how it's been applied so that you have a good context. So uh, my background is in human resources, so human capital. I studied at Michigan State. I earned my master's there in organizational development, labor relations, and quite a bit of interest in leadership uh, emerging at that time. And then throughout my career, uh, as, I, as I kind of uh, picked up more responsibility, whether it was at, at, at uh, Hiram Walker or Cardinal Health, uh, you know, the same issues kind of kept emerging in terms of how can we improve performance and 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 the, the the most important one at that time you know nobody was talking about culture or other things we're talking about well you know if we could only improve communications in this organization we'd be a lot better off right and I, and i think that you get to hear that uh, even these days in in different forms uh, yeah we have all the means of communicating yet we still aren't connecting right and so um i, I was looking for ways to help the organization deal with its downsizing or succession planning and pick the right people because as organizations grow sometimes you know they they're not very good at selecting the right people to lead their functions and departments and and that causes friction between between organize between uh, departments and 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 regions and things like this so my interest was trying to improve communications but i also uh was able to kind of figure out that if you can if you can measure who's talking to whom in an organization as opposed to worrying about the the hierarchy the path that is prescribed to follow you might get a better sense of who's really influential and who's really connected in the organization and then why not uh, drive communication and select the people that are already doing that in the organization so in essence uh, my interest was in the leadership qualities of people who were able to influence and integrate other functions and departments in organizations. And so, so you know, I came across in 97, uh, a former a graduate student at Michigan State who was using this model called social network analysis, right? Now it's a big deal. A lot of organizations use it, a lot of consulting firms. But when I started using it, it was a pencil and paper test and you had to, um, ask the questions because there's only one way to get data and that is to ask very specific questions for instance who do you talk to about what's going on in the organization think about that who do you talk to about what's happening in our club and you might think you know who you talk to and who has the most influence but unless you map it out and you get the points of view of everyone involved you're not absolutely sure so uh i started using social network analysis in a pen and paper you know style and uh you know was able to kind of help our organization and then in 2001 my brother who happens to be you know doing a lot of good things at university of maryland you know he's turning around the program i'm, I'm not sure how he's doing it i'm sure he was using all kinds of ideas from john wooden and bobby knight and and whoever and and, and learning and experimenting with certain things and all of a sudden, you know, he's made a success of the program by 2001. You know, he's he's uh, having uh, opportunities to play in the, you know, in, in, in ACC tournaments and finals and getting invited to 
to the uh, to, to the NCAA tournament and actually getting into a couple uh, Final Fours, and and then he, you know midway through the season in two thousand and one he has this 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 meltdown in in his in his club and he's the, he's bummed out you know about what you know we were doing so well and all of a sudden nothing seems to be clicking and working so he's talking to his coaches assistant coaches about you know what what do you think's going on and they're talking about I'm not sure we're getting the leadership and so he called me and I said look why don't you really figure out who's actually leading your team you know you might have guys that you selected as captains leaders but are they really doing the job on the field and off the field to keep your team energized? Because that's what this whole thing is about, right? Continuous drive for energy and, and, and performance. And so I said, oh, yeah, sure, let's try that. So, I, uh, so I, I sent out this pencil and paper survey and I came back and like, two, you know, a couple of days later, I called him up and he happened to be driving to South Carolina for a tournament with his club. And, uh, and, and I said, look, Sash, I got to call you because, you know, I got to understand who this guy is. What, what, you know, who is this Scott Butte guy, right? And he says, what, what, why are you asking? And I said, well, because this guy is off the charts in influence and integration. And I'll, I'll show you what those, two, what, what those two terms mean in a few minutes. And she said, oh, really? He said, well, he's a red shirt sophomore, really, in essence, a junior. He's got a big role to play, but he's got no authority. So I said, well, you might want to think about making him either one of your captains or creating something where he's got a lot more authority. So he sits down with his assistant coaches. They get together, talk about it. Say, yes, Ash, this guy is right in the middle of things. You know, he's really. And so uh, I, you know, I didn't understand it as much as I do now, many years later, but uh, as we all learn as we move forward, but he happened to be the catalyst that was connecting the entire team because of, of, of his uh, maturity, because of his drive, whatever it is, on the measures of influence and well-connected in the team, he, was, he stood out. So he makes him a captain, he calls him into his, into his, uh, into his uh, room, at the, at the hotel and he says, listen, Scotty, I want to talk to you. So Scotty thinks that he's getting, uh, he's going to get his uh, ass chewed because he's asked to go to, to, go to a, a wedding that his brother's having that weekend and Sash told him he can't go. So he's thinking the worst. Uh, he makes him the third captain and, uh, and he's like, you know, uh, elated, of course. He understands why because he's explained it to him. You know, the guys are looking for you to lead. And now he's got a guy who's, on the field and off the field leader who is in who was informal and now he's got authority he's more formal because we we found out the real dynamics of the team so scotty goes on they win the tournament he becomes the player of the he wins the player of the of the tournament they turn around their season they get to the final four i'm not sure i don't think they won in 2001 but but they had a really close run i think uh, say for a penalty kick, they could have won that 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 uh, uh, championship back in 2001. So, I at that time I thought, well, you know what? There's something here. There's something really powerful. So I started using it um, within the within my career opportunities, uh, but also later I started developing it for purposes of the sports clubs. And in 2005, uh, after several times of you know of ongoing work with Sash. Somebody called me from Business Week magazine, and they wrote a story about this model, this process, using social network analysis to identify emergent leaders in business and in, and, and in sports teams. And so, um, so I got a ton of calls. And of course, at that time, I didn't have the technology to be able to support this, and I had a career and a family, and I was kind of shy about, about going out there and, and using this and explaining the model. And so I only limited it to a very few people. And now I'm even making it limited to even a very, very small group of people, ones that are, have strong convictions about how the model is applied and how, how it, can, it can resonate with success. Because initially I jumped out and I said, yeah, let me show you, let me do this. And of course, some people think that it's a quick fix. It's not, it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of interesting uh, stuff, but it's not a quick fix. And so with that introduction, uh, what I've learned since then is that the bigger picture about sustaining success is not just about the chemistry piece, which is really the multiplier effect, 
But before that, it's about the work that we do on how we shape and define the culture of the organization, the club, or multiple um, uh, uh, functions of an organization or of a club. So for instance, you might have a single identity as a culture for a larger organization, but within that, the academy, the first team, or if you're uh, in a larger organization, the technical staff, the science staff, all of these things could have their own unique cultures, but collectively they have a unifying culture. And so for me, that is something that has to be paid attention to. And I want to, I want to talk to you about the model, how that fits in. And then I'm going to break into that DNA of team chemistry and allow for lots of questions and feedback. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the model. And, uh, for your information, right now, I'm working with three clubs, two in the MLS, and of course, three in the uh, NCAA world, and that's enough for me. So share desktop, okay, and I'm going to then bring this up. Okay, can you all see this? Yeah. Okay. So. I run a slideshow through this. And so I, I mentioned that for me, culture is important, but listen, you know, in order for me to kind of simplify it so I understand it better, I kind of created this little concept of, of, of calling it a certain type of a model. And, and for me, it kind of naturally fell into what I call the EMC squared. So Einstein's, Einstein's model of, of what it looks like, right? So for me, this high performance model is about excellence equals mastery, M times C squared. Okay, so excellence equals mastery times chemistry squared. And what chemistry, what, what mastery is, there are two parts to it, right? So this is about culture and about your values that are combined and measured in a way that you impact all kinds of things that you do in the organization. So I'll go a little deeper into culture before I, get to, before I get to the team chemistry portion, but I wanted you to visualize something so that you know, you're either working on mastery, which is culture and values, or you're working on chemistry, which is communication and connectedness, and I'll bring that up, okay? And, but most of us, most teams, most clubs, most organizations, are working on mastery okay so there's this the technical side uh the organizational side whether you like it or know it or not you're really working on values so culture is the constant whether you know it or not you're building a culture the only question is is it energizing is it neutral in terms of what you're doing every everything that you're adding into the organization everything that you're changing has an impact is it energizing your club, your players, your, your group? Is it uh, maintaining neutrality as no impact? Or is it have a, does it have a chilling effect? Okay, so I, I used an example last time of, of when, when um, uh, Moyes came into uh, uh, Manchester United. And, um, you know, he, he obviously took over an amazing culture that was defined by Alex Ferguson. So culture is shaped by the person who's at the top. And so, you know, it's rightful that if you're stepping in, that you're going to define the culture because you come in with a different set of beliefs and values. I mean, you heard Jesse Marsh talk about testing his own philosophy, testing his own uh, um, a process about what it takes to compete. And so it's rightful that Moyes comes into Man United and wants to do something. But what's important is that to figure out, have clarity over what it is that he should change and what is it that he shouldn't change. In other words, what we all need is a way to measure what culture we have, where are we strong or weak, and what is right for us to emphasize. I, I think most of the people who are, who are, who are taking on this responsibility, uh, you know, they certainly have convictions, those are the values, but they're not clear about everything that needs to be done. And it's not that simple, it's complex. And so when Moise comes in and he gets rid of the staff because he's gonna bring in his own staff, 
he's affecting the dynamics and the culture of that organization. And that affects everyone else, okay? And so that's reason why um, we, we have to continue to work on what we're doing, but we need to do it intentionally, okay? So the last piece, of course, I mentioned is this chemistry. This is a multiplier. If, most, if, if we did 5% more um, deliberately around communication and connectedness, the way that I'm gonna illustrate, it has, it, ha it has a multiple effect on performance. Okay, so, um, so in order to kind of sustain, build and sustain exceptional performance year after year, so you're not just a you know, one hit wonder, you know, one day, one year you're great, the next year not, the next year you might be good. It's all based on talent, maybe tactics, maybe luck. If you wanna sustain high performance, exceptional performance, these are the three things you're gonna have to do. So I'm jumping to the end, I'm gonna give you the answer. Intentionally and systematically, put a great deal of effort in assessing and shaping culture. Measure it and focus on it. And you can't do it every six months. Culture doesn't change, you know, you can, it can change periodically depending on the decisions you make, but you really wanna assess it every 12, 14, 16 months, okay? So that's culture. You know, we measure performance of our matches, we measure performance in our standings, but we don't measure ourselves on whether or not we're building a high performance culture. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like and how you can measure it. The other is to understand the motivational values of team members. Now that's really important because if we have that ability, then we know what it is that we will say or, or, or how we will reward certain people in our, in our team. So, um, and I don't want to get into deeper on this because that's not the, 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 the purpose of this session today. But this is an important element of, of mastery, right? And so a lot of coaches, a lot of powerful coaches are very strong at this, whether they know it or not, okay? Whether they are doing it intentionally or not. Somehow, some way, they've learned to assess and to, and to help um, uh, inspire or energize individuals. The challenge with them is that you can't possibly have amazing relationships with 22 or 30 people in your squad. It's difficult, but it's good to understand what their motivational values are. And the other part is, to me, the real nut is this whole idea of improving communication and connectedness, which I refer to as chemistry, of all members to focus and energize effort. And so E, while I use it to reflect E is excellence, but in the Einstein model, E is energy, okay? And so E has energy because everything that you do that, that, that shifts culture in a positive way or um, identifies and, and strengthens relationships or connections or bonds on the field, you are building energy. And man, you know, you can't get enough of that. You know, uh, you guys, I'm not sure you didn't hear yesterday, but I was talking to Omar Gonzalez and he talked about, listen, I'm one type of a guy when I'm happy and I'm energized and I know what that feels like. And I'm not the same guy if there's shit flying around and there's all kinds of dysfunction going on. And, I, you know, so we lose that. It's sapping. So that's why I say that it's either having a chilling effect or it's having an energizing effect. OK, so. In terms of culture then, what are we measuring, right? Um, and the reason why I said culture is, 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 you know, you have a culture whether you like it or not, it's because everything that you do defines who you are. So it's the way you do things around here, okay? Do we ask people about uh, some decisions we're gonna make in advance? Are assistant coaches involved? Are, are managers engaged in the direction that we're taking? You know, all of those things. All of the things that have come before you in terms of what was built in that organization. Are those things still valid or are they not valid anymore? Should we be changing them? Those things kind of, you know, yeah, we told, we've always done it like this because, you know, that guy set it up that way, right? I mean, I know that that's not the world anymore. We have to adapt as we know right now with the coronavirus, but most of the time we're forced to do it as opposed to knowing and intentionally adjusting for it. And so it's the thoughtware, it's the belief system. You know, if I believe that fairness is a big deal and that's my belief, okay, somebody else believes that, hey, I don't want to be fair. I'm going to be, I'm going to reward those hardworking guys first. 
okay? And I'm gonna only focus on that. The thoughtware that you come with, the belief systems that you have are part of what's going on. And so you have to understand what your belief system is. What are the values that are driving you? If it's inconsistent with what you're doing, it sends a different message out there, but it's shaping the culture. And the last thing is, what, do, what, what does our club do when really nobody's looking around here? Okay, so that's true for organizations, true for clubs. So the way that uh, I, I've, I've developed a measurement for culture is to use this model. This is called the Denison model. It's, the, it's used in organizational development. This guy's uh, from uh, University of Michigan, but I'll forgive him for that. His name is Dan Denison. Um, and, and he and I became friends. I converted the questions that are used to assess um, the, uh, the attributes of high performing cultures to sports and, and I've, I've, I've applied it. But I've also taught this at, uh, at the University of Windsor in a high performance class for the Masters of Management program. And, and I really dug into this notion of what this is about. So four traits, look at that. What we need to measure are those four quadrants, mission, consistency, involvement, and adaptability, right? And so in adaptability, I've flipped over, the only thing I've flipped is customer focus to player focus. Are we paying attention to what the players really need? And so the questions that we ask and the responses that we get so that we can measure each of these four areas and 12 dimensions are related uh, to a high performance model. And what I've done since then, and I've shared this with the other guys, is that among the 12 organizations, and I have additional ones I need to add, add to, this, uh, to this model, is that I've taken their culture scores, aggregated culture score, okay, down here you can see what that is. Um, so based on, they might have, I might have had 40 responder, respondents per club or, or organization, and uh, put it all together and give them a culture score. And then I took their winning percentage at the end of the season to see how it correlated. And look at this linear relationship, okay? So really, you know, one is an, ante one is a, 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 an antecedent, it comes before. So if you're working on culture and building culture, it will drive winning percentage up higher. And so this club right here, this team, took the culture score after six months of work and it showed that their culture score was really was pretty high but the pre the, the season that they just finished they were down here right so what it indicated to me is that if they maintained their position in terms of moving forward with how they are seeing culture that they're going to move up and hit the mark on that on that um, um, linearity curve okay right here now these are national champions including the women's basketball team uh, maryland notre dame uh virginia um you know those are these are these clubs and then these are the lower performing clubs right so you can see that if you work on culture you work on improving performance and so basically what i wanted to point out to you is that excellence is highly dependent on work around culture but the real multiplier is what we do with team chemistry and so for me that model again excellence equals mastery okay um uh, and mastery of culture is this thing in summary i want to show you a real a real uh, uh outcome of a measurement of culture so what you're looking at here in the outer layer of this of this uh, spider map. And I know sometimes you guys are gonna say, oh, this is pretty, pretty busy. But here's what we have here, right? We have 12 attributes of high performance culture, okay? And we have measures of each of these. This is an aggregate of three high performing teams with high winning percentage, 70% plus winning percentage and over 80% on culture score right here. This is a, uh, a professional team shall, that shall remain nameless because Ryan's recording this and he's gonna show it later and I don't wanna get any feedback about highlighting you know, who this was. Um, but you can see what's happened here, right? On player focus, it seems like the par for player focus happens to be in this category, which is interesting. I think every club needs to work 
on this to move it to, to move it higher in the standing okay and on flexibility and change well guess what folks we're learning very quickly about the ability to adapt right now in terms of what's going on and we're not prepared that well yet so it means that we collectively as clubs and organizations have have to do a better job but the par the standard is pretty low here's the biggest difference between the high performing cultures and where this mls team was uh, back in 2015 okay and so if if i wanted to highlight what area they needed to pay attention to it was in mission and inconsistency okay so they weren't very clear about their goals and objectives they weren't very clear about what their purpose was okay right here and i think that they were working on strategy but it wasn't co being communicated effectively yet and i know that for a fact and on consistency they didn't clarify their values they were very poor at reaching agreement between certain parts of 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 the club and organization hey listen i think we should do this no i think we should do this and it took forever to reach agreement and of course you know the, the departments as a result of this weren't well integrated and coordinated because they didn't have clear goals and objectives so the primary work for them was here not so much on involvement and on adaptability right and so my recommendation to them was let's focus on clarity of purpose goals and objectives and on on, on, on working on our values and and that organization learned quite a bit about themselves and changed a lot of things in what they were doing and i didn't have to do it you know any more work than to provide uh the mirror and the map to what they needed to work on. So here's, here's what I also showed in terms of, you know, why, so if that's the case, you can drill down in culture assessments and say, well, what is the coach thinking, which is in the blue, but what is the, uh, the coach is in red, and, the, and what is the rest of the respondent group thinking? So the coach is thinking, hey man, our values are pretty clear. That's what I'm thinking. But the rest of the organization is saying, no, we need a hell of a lot more work there. Right, so that that discrepancy in terms of perception is that one that needs to be overcome. You know, in everything that we do, we all have great intentions. We think we're doing the right things, but how people are perceiving it and what's actually happening, you know, in our in our club or organization might be two different things unless you're able to measure that somewhat effectively. And you can see two of the lowest scores happen to be about coordination, integration, and agreement. And you know what this is all about? Execution. You know, you can have really good plans and visions, but if you don't get this right, you're not gonna be able to execute from a culture perspective in organizations, okay? So anyways, that's the culture bit. I'm gonna move over to chemistry right now, and that is really the focus on communication and connectedness. And, and, and I wanted to you know, wrap it up again that the model, the overall model, again, you know, for me, simply is excellence is equal, is, is, is equal to uh, mastery times chemistry squared equals mastery times chemistry squared. Mastery is culture and chemistry is communication and connectedness. So I want to pause here for a second so I can, well, I don't have my tea anymore, but I'll give you a chance to ask any questions on this. And then I'll move on to the next uh, to the next piece. Ryan, do you want to do you want to follow up, or Peter, or ask anyone to raise their hand? Yeah, you guys can kind of chime in if you want. Uh, you're you, you're able to unmute yourself, so. Oh, Pancho. Yes. So I thought it was back on the screen where you had um, the inside web, like you showed the difference, and you had the two on the right, uh, yeah. right there. Yeah. And then it, you had the comparison, sorry, between their strategy. Where's strategy? At the top? Right the here. The comparison from coach, I think it was the next screen, coach to player, what they thought. Yep. Coach was in the red. Yes. Um, if you go back to that. Okay. Looking at, like, so the coach, the coach seemed like he was folk, probably his whole focus was strategy and goals and objectives. And the, and the players, it almost seems like the players and other people thought they did too much, way more strategy. And the coach felt like he didn't do enough. Yeah, it's so, interesting. That's a, very good, that's a very good observation. Uh, in fact, I, I think that 
you know, they were just beginning to shape and define their strategy. But if you give people a little bit of clarity, you know, they're happy. Yeah. And so, so at that point, and, you know, I think you know who I'm talking about here. Greg Vanny is feeling, oh, man, there's so much more work to be done around our direction. And, and you know, I, we've got a lot of work to do. But, you know, I, I think that this is one area where you say, you know what, even though this shows that we're doing a pretty decent job, I'm thinking maybe I need to do a little bit more work, but it's not going to be my number one priority. I'm going to focus here because you can't do everything to address every single piece of this, of this, uh, um, um, uh, you know, the actions that are required to fix things. You just don't have enough resources to fix everything. And, and people are going to, you know, you're, you're going to stress the, the system out. So very selectively and systematically and intentionally, Pick the things that give us the most, the most value. Great, great observation. So, so when, yeah, sorry. yeah, Ronnie, go ahead. So when it came to how you got the, when you interviewed the players and the coaches, was it more of a survey? Was it more of a one-on-one -on -one with each individual player and coach to get your data? So how'd you, how'd you gather your data? Great, great question. So, so I usually do it because of efficiency and cost effectiveness through a survey. So the survey is anonymous and I promise them that the survey is anonymous. Um, so it's a, it's a survey. I meet with the group, if it's, especially if it's a large group. We let them know what the process is about, what the practice is, why it's important to do, this, to, to do the survey. So they do it that way. Now, larger consulting organizations in the, some, of the, some of the bigger uh, clubs, they'll do a survey, but they'll also do the, the questionnaires. They'll do some you know, follow-ups. They'll sit down and say, well, what's happening here? And you can take the initial survey and then target specifically those areas, right? But in my survey, I have some open-ended questions I can collect at the end, some, some data. Um, you know, and the three or four people that I'm engaged with will have will, will, aha like it's like an aha moment when they see certain things and then they highlight and so really it's about how much time do you have how much money do you want to spend and what do you want to get out of this right uh, i think a survey is sufficient to get people started because uh you know unless unless you have um you know funding uh and the time to do all of this right you know you can you can get away with with doing just something, not not everything. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Ryan, I'm going to carry on. Yeah. Okay. So let me get to the fun stuff. I think that most of you are going to really like, and I wanted to illustrate this network map because I'm going to give you real live data to share. I'm going to take the names out for obvious reasons, but I'll let you know how I've applied it in the past and what we can do with it and. And, you know, you might be one of those people that are creative enough to say, oh, my God, I can use this for many other things rather than just what, I'm, what, what you're telling me about. So there's a lot of creativity. So I'm going to illustrate uh, network maps, and I'll show you the questions that we pose. So while the culture survey is 60 questions for 12 attributes, this survey can be only as little as three or four or eight, as much as eight. I use eight so that I can actually compare and contrast teams no matter what team it is i can compare and contrast them later because i'm using the same norms right the same questions and so what we're going to see here are two things i'm going to point out look at the relationship between this blue uh, node and this red node you can see that the arrow is pointing only one way so i want you to understand that if you if, if i'm pointing this way i'm being influenced by this person Right. So the questions that I'm asking is that who do you go to or who do you uh, who do you uh, go to when the team is struggling and needs a leadership on the field? Right. So now if I say it's Ron Clark and he's here and Ron doesn't point back to me. He's he's influence. You know, he has influence over me. Right. And if enough people point to Ron, now we think that, hey. Ron's got a lot of influence here, like this person, right? Or maybe this person, right? So what we get is a collective algorithm input 
you know, so this person here, it'll look, it'll work like this, right? This person is getting, um, has influence over that person, but also over this person because he's connected to that person, right? So the algorithm adds values through us, through a network of connections. But the ones that are closest to each other are the ones that have this relationship down here, integration, both ways. So when we ask the question, it's always a question like, who do you talk to about what's going on with the team? And then, you, and then the player has to respond to every other player on the list. It could be a player, it could be a coach, it could be anyone else on staff that we include in the survey, but the responses have to be 100%. So if I say, I look to Ryan Mandoka, and Ryan looks back to me, what this is is a trusting relationship at the highest level, okay? So those are the two things I want you to understand. Symmetrical relationships, trust relationships, or influential relationships, one way, okay? And so the questions that we ask are four on-field questions. Who do you look to for on-field leadership when the team is struggling? If you have a camera, you want to snap this so you can see, see what question I'm referring to later. It's up to you. Go ahead and you can do that. I used to say these are proprietary questions. You can't use them. They are proprietary. But on the other hand, not many people can illustrate the way that I can because I'm the only one that has a software. So you have to struggle to figure out how to use this if, if you don't use my software. But who do you look to for on-field leadership when the team is struggling? When you're struggling on the field, who helps you bounce back, okay? Who do you trust most on the ball? And whom do you rely upon when your team needs unity and motivation, right? Four on-field questions, four off-field. Who do you talk to about what's going on with the team? With whom do you go out socially when you can find the time? From whom do you seek input and opinions before making personal decisions? And then who do you look to address off-the-field behavior that may affect team performance? Okay, so... Every player has to respond on a scale of one to five for everyone else, 100% participation. Okay, so now I'm gonna bring up, I'll leave that slide where it is, but I'm going to stop sharing. I'm gonna pick up another document to share. Share screen. Okay. Oh, I've gotta pick this thing up. Right here. Okay. Everybody see that? Uh, that map clearly? Yes, good, Ryan? Somebody who can see yeah, it? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken question number three, which is who do you trust most on the ball? And I've applied two measures, four and five, almost always and always, right? And, and this is Sasha's uh, spring team. He's got about 22, three guys. I've picked out like, his starting 11 that I think, you know, is looks like he's got a good starting 11 here. And when I take a look at uh, this map, I see a couple of things. But what do you guys see right from the outset? In terms of some of the connections or, or, or general observations, do you see a good connected network? So, you know, I, I, I don't hear a response, but I can imagine that, you know, by looking at it, you say, yeah, it looks like everybody's pointing different directions and things like this. It looks good. But what I would highlight, even at this level, it looks pretty decent. I have an arrow pointing straight here, but I don't have anything going back here. I have nothing between these two players. So my left center back and my goalkeeper don't have a trusting relationship. My left back and my goalkeeper don't have a high trusting relationship. And this here is a one-way relationship. This here is a one-way relationship. So right at the outset, I'm thinking, hmm, my left side is going to be weak. But the way illustrate that to Sash or to, or to the coaches, I might take this out. Okay, and I say, all right, let's take out the value of four and let's only go to five, right? Now all of a sudden I see gaps in terms of or opportunities where I can strengthen the chemistry of the team. Okay, and I see that clearly that I don't have a relationship here, I don't have it here, and I don't have it here. 
Well, maybe if I, let's see, maybe if I moved this guy over here and I moved this guy over here, does it help? Hmm, not that much. Okay, well, what if I had, what if this guy played here and this guy played in here? Well, that helps me on the outside. I still have nothing here, you know, and again, this is, this is only, only a way to take a look at how I can best cover uh, chemistry on the field by showing where trust levels are going to be. So if I, if I need to have strength on the outside, then maybe I'll rethink how I'm going to play my team. Now, some of us pigeonhole players, and we say, well, they can't play over here because of this, because of that. But then, you know, we don't think in a whole different way and say, but the players that they're playing with have exceptional confidence in them. Right. And so maybe they're right and I'm wrong in terms of my perception. So there's an opportunity to, to take a look at this. Or you might say, maybe this is this is a better formation if I played a 4-4-2. If I put this guy up here, okay, and then I took this guy out here. Wow, look at that. That improves things. Now, but I have a weak spot with six here. Okay. So now. I might take a look at that and I say, well, yeah, but you know what? I don't want to play a 4-4-2 because these two guys aren't, you know, they're not very well connected. So you know what? I'd rather drop this guy here, play this guy here. Maybe we'll play it like this. There's all kinds of ways to look at it. Another way you can look at it, and I'm only using one question right now, right? And there's so many more. If I show the symmetrical links, now show me only the relationships that are equal back and forth at the five scale. And so I apply that. Now I've got, oh my goodness, I'm still, I'm still really weak on the left-hand side. I've got many ways to work on, okay? But this to me is sort of really ringing out as much potential as possible, like really getting into the nitty gritty and saying, what ounce of, of, of energy or chemistry can I still eke out of these players, right? And how can I set them up? Now you can also take in, you know, you could go down here, like I can go up here and grab somebody else, grab another player, you know, uh, shirt number. I can pick up, you know, somebody else and put the other one in, right? There's all kinds of things that I can try to do um, once, once uh, you know, I have time to, to exercise this process, right? So what this tells you is that the relationships on the field and, I've, and if I pulled some of these other, um, other questions out, for instance, off the field, so let's use question number five, is who do you talk to? Who do you, who do you um, talk to about what's going on with the team, right? So imagine this right now, this, this map. Now we're flipping over to another question and to see how that changes. It doesn't change that much, does it? I mean, it changes slightly, but not that much. You still have the same relationships, in a sense. Who do you talk to about what's going on with the team? And who do you trust most on the ball? Okay. This relationship didn't change. This didn't change. A couple changed, right? And it's not perfect linearity. It's not something off the field isn't but it tends to do that. If you have strong ties off the field or informal ties, you're going to have strong ties on the field. Okay. Pancho, would, yes, you, would you do something at this point when your goalkeeper doesn't really have a lot of relationship with anybody on the team? Mm -hmm. Whether even the back four that they protect each other? Yeah, I mean, so the interventions, I think, you know, JJ, if, if we didn't cover it last time, is that they're varied and creative. So there are things that you might do with, with this. Okay, so look, you're concerned about trust on the ball, if that was the question. So, for instance, number three is, is the trust, right? Um, let me see. Do I have it? Yeah, at, at, at that level. Okay, so I'm going to add four. Okay, just to see. All right, so now I want to target who I'm going to work with. I want to make sure that I have this relationship, and I want to make sure I have this relationship and this, okay? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because this is already there. So I'm going to find out what is it that's failing, right? 
what am I, what part of his game is it, is it, is it on the feet? Is it distribution? Is it second, you know, uh, bounces, you know, what is it that I want to do? And then of course I end up working together on it until I generally build more confidence. So I might, in this particular case, 12 might never play the ball back to the goalkeeper. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and when he has to, when it's important to do that because of that kind of mindset, now I'm not saying it's automatic because sometimes you can switch that off and the game dictates and you do that, but we're, we're human beings. You know, we tend to kind of either have confidence in people or not, and we kind of shift away from them or we look to them. And so in this, in this formation, I would say that the ball is going to probably move towards the right of the field, right? The goalkeeper is going to play the ball to the right more, more often than not. And, you know, if he had a choice and we're going to see, you know, that kind of stuff emerging. So there's all kinds of things that you can kind of dive in and look at. Okay. Um, let me show you some, some other things that are interesting. Okay. So I've shown you how you can kind of play around with the roster and taking a look. But what I really care about here is trying to identify who the emergent leaders are. Because to me, building strong team chemistry is making sure that you've got the right leaders in place. And so if I'm going to do this, I'm going to take a look at question number one. And I'm going to take a look at that at four and five scale. Okay. And I'm going to take a look to see what my metrics are. So when I take a look at the metrics, I can check the score on influence to see who is the player that has the most influence in this question. Okay, so it's number seven. He scores the highest. The difference between 10 and nine isn't very much, but I've only used 11 players, right? I have another 11 that I'm not included here who would raise the profile here on this influence score. So if I have the combined team, I might get up to like 18 or 19, and the next lowest might be, 14, right? It'll give me a larger uh, uh, data. So just to, just to show you how that works, I go back in here. Okay. I'm going to add all the rest of the players, okay? So I can show you how. Poncho, as you're doing that, yeah. I'll just comment. If you're wondering, so the colors are position? Yes. So the shapes are like what year they're in. So right. when you're talking about uh, trust and bonds, that also came and comes into consideration as like a university coach or could be like a league one or, or an older coach that has multiple age groups because it's obviously of the same year that may be a deeper bond. Right, right. So what you end up seeing in this is, so I've given you sort of, this is a fixed layout. Okay, I'm going to let it happen naturally on its own. And so the screen is going gonna, is gonna to dictate who's kind of positioning next to whom and what the real relationships look like. Okay. So you can see now you can see clusters being formed. Okay. So, so you have, you know, these three guys here, these four guys here. So you have, a, this is a senior group perhaps. Okay. But you can see some integration, you know, tendency to do this, but I'm also interested here in checking the metrics. And so when I take a look at the score and I run it, See what the influence is. Well, okay, so this guy is not very influential. Okay, this guy here, he's scoring at 24. Hmm. Okay, on this particular, on this particular uh, measure, I get a guy that's slightly standing out. Not much of a difference between here. So I have quite a few people I can go to. I go to the next question, right? And I'm going to close that up. And I go to the next question to see what the inter, what the score is, right? And I go, this is the who do you who comes to your support when you're having a bad day or not playing well? Who looks who looks out for you when you're struggling? Okay, so now I take a look at this map, and I see that my support network, in terms of metrics, okay, I run influence on that, and I see well. You know, a lot of guys are providing support. Really good. I love that. But who is the most impactful? Who is the most integrated? So I run an integration score. Who's in the middle of all of this stuff? Who, who gets the most impact? And I can see that, hey, number 25, he's really high, but so is number 11. Okay. Really impactful. So, you know, when I go back to this whole idea of what is the DNA of team chemistry, 
Now I'm kind of simplifying it and I'm saying, look, on the, the bigger picture, it's about addressing culture and values, but about chemistry, it simply is, it's connection, it's communication and connectedness, but you don't measure that. What you want to check is who has the most influence and who is the most integrated. And you can have players that have high influence. They don't care about, you know, integrating with everyone else, nor being vocal, nor being communicative. But then you have those gems, two or three or four guys that dem demonstrate the potential of being highly influential because they have some certain mastery or skill set or whatever it is or appeal that people like and value and they respond that way in these questions but those people also are well connected in the network and what they say is impactful so if i if jesse marsh tells me something uh you know and i'm one of those leaders out here he can be sure that it's going to get across to everybody else okay and so you know this is where sometimes you wonder why you have to coach from the sidelines and dictate and direct if you don't have you know two or three or four people that you can trust that know exactly what you're looking for they and they also have the ability to influence others right and so we have to foster emergent leaders so we have to identify who they are and that's why you know i think and i'm not you know like the coaches who use this stuff buy into it and really regularly look after it and they build succession plans on the basis of well, when is my next leader going to be and so I, I don't have to struggle next year for leadership or the year after because you're building a leadership pipeline and not worry about captains so much so for me this whole idea was to change the, the definition of captainship to leadership and we started building leadership councils back in 2004 and, and five when when uh when we discovered that it's not one guy that has influence or integration it's multiple guys and so really you know you asked me last time brian you know what is that number on a group of about 25 to 30 you probably have about four or five guys that can be identified as having strong impact and those are the guys that you need to build strong relationships with in some ways and sometimes it doesn't work for whatever reason but it doesn't mean that you can't you can you can ignore the fact that that person has influence and is well integrated um, in the uh, in the overall uh, dynamics of the team okay so so the last thing i do is i kind of take those maps and i compare the off the field and on the field just to illustrate how 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 kind of similar they are and uh we kind of play around with and say hey listen what happens you know, I kind of pause this, right? And I say, all right, if we, you know, look at that guy, right? But you know what? That guy isn't pointing to anybody else. Like, you know, everybody's pointing to him. So why isn't that the case? Now we have an intervention. We really go into, into a conversation with the individual about that. And that's okay. You can't change people, people's personalities. You cannot do that. But as a leader of a club or a culture, you can set expectations. And you can highlight and you can educate and inform look you happen to be an informal leader whether you like it or not the question is what do you you know do you want to take on that responsibility and then how do we get the most of it so part of that is that coaching up your leaders and those are the kind of things that, that we kind of look after and we also look for clusters because you could kind of take a look at these metrics and you can set up any kind of demographic so for me you know shirt number position seniority you know role uh language this could be ethnicity you know you could change you know what part of the world you come from you know what continent you come from you know do we have clustering around that is that part of an issue uh, uh, you can change some of the questions if you like you know you might be able to convince me that we should do we should apply a different question to, to really understand that uh that dna component of influence and integration and so we will apply a different question uh, in order to get to that, that that final layout okay so without going too much into this it's a lot of potential to spend two hours three hours on watching these maps develop circulate move around um, but in the interest of time i want to just wrap up and show you how we we illustrate some of these things in terms of uh, I, I keep talking about influence and integration 
And so I want to show you this part right here. So, you know, that question about who do you trust most with the ball, right? Um, you know, there are three clusters of confidence in this group. There's this one down here, you know, low influence and low integration. And then there's this one here, mediocre. And then there's a group over here on the right where you see quite a bit, which is nice. It's nice to see everybody over here. So really what I'm looking for here, who do you trust most with the ball? It's not their ability to integrate. It's really about their influence, right? So if I see more people on the right, on the right side, that's pretty good. Uh, let me see if I can show you. Uh, so this is a different one. This is important, influence and integration. When you're struggling on the field, who helps you bounce back? Okay, and you can see over to the right a couple of people that emerge that are there. And those are my leaders. Those are the people that I'm looking to, to lead. Okay. Um, and I wanted to show you this one. My, my computer is acting up and it's kind of going slow. So we're going to, I'm going to just stop sharing at this point and that's the end of the slideshow. So I, I think, you know, for me, just to impart the whole idea of the model, uh, is, is really just to remember it as excellence is about mastery and that's culture and motivational values, but it's really multiplied by measuring and, and acknowledging what the dynamics of the team are and who is key to helping you uh, impact performance on the field. And that means selecting the right leaders. So the multiplier is chemistry and not many people actually um, take the time to, uh, to, to, to take an x-ray of their team and understand that and then pick the right leaders. That supports the culture and it supports um, the sustainability of high level performance and high level energy. Uh, right. So it, it takes effort, uh, but, but this is worth the effort because I think everybody else is doing the other stuff. You know, we're, we're doing great on fitness. We know how to train. We have all the, all the information available to anybody, even online right now, about you know, learning how to coach. And of course, there are things that you have to make your own. But if you apply something different and innovative and creative in your thinking using that model, I think it can help kind of build momentum and, and, and continue to drive uh, excellence in your program. Hey, Vancha, I got a question for you. Yes, fire, fire away. So what do the clubs do with the players where, you know, you have a, some of them that were disconnected, like two, three players, and then you were right. kind of moving, moving them there around? So basically, like, what do the clubs do with these players? Okay, do they have some kind of meeting with them? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. So um, the thing is this. Sometimes, um, the, the, that's a great question only because they're not, you know, these players were selected because of their skill and their talent and their expected contribution to the team in some way. I needed somebody here, somebody there. But you don't really know what the, uh, you know, motivational drivers are of some of these kids. So they may, you know, have a girlfriend and they want to spend time with their girlfriend, but they never engage in any of the social activities. They're studying to be a doctor and they're, you know, I'm using college students as an example for this. And so it doesn't impact their performance on the field personally. And the belief is that if, if uh, you know, in my case, you know, the belief is always that you can always improve your on the field performance if you're more engaged. And so you do have conversations with the player without trying to um, change their value system. What, what I've seen happen is that, look, you know, the conversations start with, let's add something more to what you can do for this organization, as opposed to stop doing this, right? And so in this case, it's about no one's asking you to stop seeing your girlfriend, but you got to create time in your schedule for the, these other things. And so in this case, a coach might um, implement a project that requires a certain kind of connection between other players off the field, or you might do something else uh, that is more energizing. And it's not, it's not, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to refer to it as sort of strategic, uh, you know, chemistry building, but it, but it does take creativity uh, with an honesty, you know, with, 
in, the intention has to be right. I never wanted to show, I, I, I hesitated you doing some of these analyses uh, in, in organizations where we found someone like that and then they were ready for, for redundancy, right? Package, see you later, you're disconnected, you know, you're gone. Or a player, you know, who seems to be kind of somewhat disconnected and they're part of a, uh, an exit strategy. This happens in professional sports all the time and it might, it might be useful to know that, but I will, I will never go into a, a, a project where it's the, the negative uh, outcome or the consequence is part of the plan. I want to make sure that we do whatever we can uh, to build. And if the player now understands something and doesn't want to participate, doesn't want to help build proper chemistry, well, those are different consequences then, right? But you've, all, but you've created some, some knowledge. I hope that's a, it's a long-winded answer, but it's an important question to ask. Vancho, when you're doing these models and presenting to organizations, how long usually is the turnaround to see the, the culture change or the, the data that you're presenting, how long does it usually take for them to, to turn okay. it around? So the chemistry stuff, you see change because, because that is sort of fluid, right? You know. Uh, at Division One, you have eight players leaving in the spring. You have nine players coming in, you know, in the fall. So we do these analyses about two or three times a year just to see what's happening. So usually in the spring when they're kind of forming and then when they're reforming again in the fall after a couple of weeks of training and then sometime in the middle because if things are going great, you might want to check to see what's going great or not. Or if things are kind of derailing, you might want to know what's happening. Where am I, you know, what's happening to my leadership? You know, what's going on? I've had, I've had, uh, you know, Damon Ranson, you know, one spring, he selected certain people as his leadership team. In the fall, they were, you know, they, they were nowhere to be seen. Something happened between the spring and the fall, and he dropped a person. He said, listen, I, I can't have you on my leadership team. Just, you know, you, you've been completely AWOL in a sense. Right. But it's an honest conversation and it's, you know, you have to have to accept it. Um, so the turnaround is a week after the survey is done. That's not a big deal. And then the impact could be immediate. OK, but what's really good about this is not to notice the immediacy, but to see performance improvement because you're making subtle changes. Right. right? On the chemistry side, it's subtle changes. You're making the right decisions. You're not messing things up. On the culture side, that might take things that you're trying to implement, implement and change. It might take two to three months to see right. benefits of something like that. But, but once that starts, it's like a domino effect. You know, it's like a, you know, a tipping point. And all of a sudden, you see all kinds of people trying to contribute and energize by what you're doing. But that one, that has to be authentically driven by a person at the top of the organization who has a great clarity of purpose, knows about what values you want to implement and, and, and pursues them systematically. Thank you. Any other questions? Peter, you got anything or you asked them all, uh, all before? <laughs> but you're muted. I asked them all last week, right? <laughs> no, it's good. It's yeah. good. I, I mean, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I, there's some key principles that I needed to convey that are always important to share. And some, some uh, other things might pop up, but I, I generally, it's the same uh, material. So unless we have new, new faces on here, uh, I, I don't think that we have to repeat, you know, questions yeah yeah and just for you know coming from my perspective i know we've put some of this to use um at the university uh and uh you know it was it was insightful i think there was a couple of those moments uh i don't know if vancho was referring to one of our players but one of the players who was doing his masters who wanted to spend time with his girlfriend and struggled to integrate with the team and yeah we had to task him with a social uh social integration project with his teammates. He was one of the lone senior players and, and it was tough. So 
um, definitely have been there and, and uh, it is a different way of uh, looking at chemistry and culture. So, you know, we, we appreciate you spending the time, Vonch, and uh, like I said, opening up those questions and your process to us. I mean, if you have any uh, final words and uh, just want to say. No, I, I, I really just think that, you know, it's something that uh, it has to be part of your belief system and it needs to be, you know, it's not one year you do this, next year you don't. It either, either you kind of take the model up and figure out how to apply it yourself. And if, uh, you know, read this ton of stuff on this stuff in different places, you know, uh, my, my analysis isn't the only one that can be used, but really it's about, and, and maybe, you know, maybe, you know, some of you guys come up with some ideas and say, hey, did you ever think about this? I'd love to incorporate that into wh whatever we're doing. This is still a learning and a continuously improving uh, model. And so I hope that, uh, you know, you got some insight. And then, you know, we can, we can work together at some point. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, no, Martin, Vancho can't help you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Is that no, a competing no. coach? Yeah, no, no, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is, so this is what I get from, uh, from uh, Sash. Hmm. At, uh, he said, look, in the, uh, in the big 10, you know, you can only work with Michigan state and with Maryland and you can't work with anybody else. I'm thinking, so now I got to find clients in the ACC or I got to find clients in the, on the, you know, in the big 12 or something like that. <laughs> and so, because I work with Columbus and Toronto, you know, I think, you know, I have to look for another division, you know, one of the other divisions somewhere else. I'm limited because they don't want, you know, hey, if you're working with us, you can't work with our, the people in my, in our division. So I'm kind of getting limited by doing this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's enough for me, though. It's fun. Thanks. Thanks, Vonch, again, on behalf of uh, Tecumseh Soccer Club and everyone. We got coaches from around the OUA and around Ontario. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll be posting this, like I said. And uh, appreciate you coming in and spending the time, coaches. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, our 10th event tomorrow with uh, Frankie Facinari, local, uh, local professional player. Um, so, uh, if any of your players are, are, are looking to join and want some inspiration, uh, we're really happy to have Frankie, uh, homegrown player with the Vancouver Whitecaps is on tomorrow. Um, so we're happy he came from, uh, Windsor FC Nationals to Bardar to, uh, to Vancouver. So happy to host. So thanks everyone. Vaughn, thanks, thanks Ryan. Thanks Ryan. Bye guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks Ryan. Thanks much. Thanks Ryan. Thanks, guys.